Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, we really appreciate it and we appreciate everybody being here. Uh, today, I'm very happy to introduce Tim Ireland. Tim is a lifelong geologist who grew up in Adelaide, South Australia, surrounded by both in industry and academic geology. He earned his PhD from the University of Tasmania in the Coates Group, and he's worked for juniors, mid-tier, and major companies all across the world doing greenfield exploration in uh, several resources, including copper, gold, and nickel. Since 2013, Tim has been the uh, technical lead at First Quantum Minerals, uh, where he is um, still affiliated today. And we're very happy to have, have Tim on to talk to us about exploration models and how to, how to search for new exploration target locations and regions. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tim. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Charles. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's morning where I am, so that's what, that's what we're going to call it. Um, it's quite flattering to be invited to give a talk like this. Um, so I hope that some of what I have to say is, um, is interesting or, or useful to you, um, but it's going to be a fairly high level talk. Um, I'm going to dip into a bit of detail around um, First Quantum's enterprise set hosted nickel deposit in Zambia. Um, and we'll bounce around some ideas of the restrictions and, and flexibilities of, of different exploration models. Um, the enterprise nickel deposit serves that purpose because it's so different. And when we got there and started exploring it, um, there really wasn't any um, any useful model that we could apply. So I'll start by saying what's good about exploration models. They're, they're primarily a convenient shorthand. This diagram from one of Dick Silito's papers is perhaps the best known, I guess, visual impression of, a, of an autoposit model. Um, it's been many decades in the, in the evolution. But now I can put it up there and without really saying very much beyond allowing a geologist to interrogate that diagram and I guess a, an expectation that you've seen it before and you know something about the, the family of deposits that occur around porphyry copper systems, that you, you intuit straight away something around host rock environment and you intuit something else around the geometric controls, what roughly what shape it, is the ore body likely to be, roughly what shapes in three dimensions are the, the alteration domains likely to be, um, what, what kind of family of small occurrences might occur in and around or above a porphyry. Um, and from that point, it's not a great leap to start thinking about the distribution of the geochemical footprint, a la Scott Halley, or the geophysical proxies for ore, if you know where the magnetite rich alteration is or where the magnetite bearing intrusions are on a diagram like that, then you don't need to know a lot of geophysics to be able to imagine what happens next in terms of the response that, that a deposit might, might, might yield. To a different group of people, the model is also a convenient shorthand in terms of likely development scenarios to resource geos, to mining engineers, metallurgists, uh, investor type people. When we use the phrase porphyry copper system, that it like cues a, a whole set of thoughts around likely grade and tonnage characteristics, and therefore the mining scenarios that might be relevant. Um, including, but not limited to, the, the requisite infrastructure. I've got a picture on the screen here from, from our Copper Panama um, operation in, in Panama. Um, and part of that development is a whole new port facility, a power station that electrifies part of the country in addition to the mine, a whole bunch of things that, that are part and parcel of what's possible as the development scenario from a porphyry. If, I, if it was a, you know, an, an epithermal gold vein, for example, like the... That, that has a whole different shorthand attached to it in terms of what we imagine um, on, upon hearing those words. Models are also a convenient shorthand for talking about the, the big picture stuff. And this is, this is, I guess, my particular bent. I work in generative and greenfield geology. And so I, I like, or I'm tasked with trying to predict the places to go exploring. In the case of the porphyry model, what it has to say around tectonic environment leads us to select particular regions of the world and what it has to say around the metallogenic context, um, it, like the family of, of other deposits that live in, in and around porphyries, help us to choose um, individual stratigraphic locations or moments in, in time um, within a region. So the model speaks to all these different things and it, and it speaks to them to different people and at different scales very effectively. Um, but all models are wrong. This famous quote from, from George Box, um, I think made in 1976, um, 
is something that we should all have printed on the wall that the models that we use are fundamentally wrong they we can't we can't hope to replicate simply replicate the world in a in a little diagram some of those models are going to be useful some models are really attractive and the best models are attractive they're they're elegant in their simplicity because they don't try to over predict the world they tell us they describe something about the way models were or something about the fundamentals of a system without trying to specify every individual aspect and as soon as they do start to be too specific then we're blinded to the natural variability that exists in the world um, it's easy to imagine for example a lot of climate modeling goes on tries very very hard to be very very predictive i think beyond its ability to actually um, represent the world and so they're blinding new data comes in should force a change of the model and can't because the model is so inflexible, perhaps because so much effort has gone into building it. So models shift in response to the force of evidence or they should, the best ones do. So what we're gonna do now is walk through a couple of little stages in things that have happened to the Porphyry model um, over a period of time. The Porphyry model, I guess, as presently understood. It's a paper that all first year geologists get pointed to from the late 60s and early 70s and Lowell and Gilbert. Um, deposits with porphyry characteristics had been explored for some time before that. In fact, the earlier, some of the earlier descriptions of things that these days would be called porphyries, I think date back to 1910 or the 1920s. Um, but nonetheless, it wasn't written down and published and therefore, I guess, marking a point in the publication record at which everyone has access to this particular concept of a deposit model until the late 60s, and it rumbled along being used very effectively through the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, a big flurry of discoveries in the Andes through the, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but I thought it was interesting. This is a paper here from Jeff Hedenquist and, and Jacob Lowenstern in Nature, of all places, summing up what had clearly been an emerging point of observation around epithermal systems, that the fluids have magmatic components to them, that Epithermal systems weren't simply the product of um, geothermal systems that could form from an ambient geothermal gradient, albeit in areas of higher geotherm, but have direct magmatic contributions. And that opened the door to the idea that epithermals and porphyries might have more than just a passing spatial relationship with each other. Step forward a few years in time, and Jeff Hedenquist again, perhaps one of the one of the one of the most fun, most fundamental uh, public researchers and, and publicists of things to do with porphyry epithermal models, documenting the, the quite incredible geology of the Lepanto district in, in Northern Philippines and showing a correspondence both in time, effectively indistinguishable timing between porphyry and high sulfidation epithermal, and also temperature. This little section clipped from his paper here showing fluid inclusion, homogenization temperatures, cooling out laterally away from the porphyry in the high sulfidation system that was forming at the same time. And this, this section and variations of it, I think, illustrated to generations of geologists, like suddenly it's like the lights went on and we could understand immediately the genetic relationship between porphyries and, and high sulfidation epithermals. Step forward a, a few years more, and we've taken a leap. This is Silito and Hedenquist in, in a SEG special publications chapter from 2003, linking epithermal styles, epithermal deposits. In, not too, too long before this, Marco Einaudi had been talking about different sulfidation state classifications for epithermals. And now we've gone to linking epithermal styles in, well, we, we had just seen that they were linked in time to porphyries, or some of them are. And now we can look at different epithermal styles and link them to different tectonic environments. In this particular case, the authors were making the point that in andesitic uh, stratovolcano dominated and compressive environment dominated um, tectonic settings, we tended to see copper gold high sulfidation systems um, as the epithermal, I guess, end member. And that a lot of the low sulfidation gold, gold, silver, silver only systems lived in rifts and were associated with bimodal volcanics and extensional tectonics. And that was another, I guess, appreciation that of this sort of growing ex expanded model of a, of a family of things that might be associated with porphyries. In this case, particularly the, the recognition that, that high sulfidation systems specifically lived in the same tectonic environment as, as porphyries was a, was a step forward. 
included in this paper is a, a delightful little quote that um, I'll come back to in a minute and, in fact, shows there's nothing new under the sun. That, like, almost in passing, these authors mention that VMS deposits might be submarine analogues of low sulfidation epithermal systems. Hmm. Interesting. There are other observations that force model shifts in porphyries. Perhaps the most recent comes from John Prophet and has been elaborated on by, by my colleague Federico Sonushi, um, pointing at the difference between vein arrays in porphyries, that the classic solitonian porphyries that have, I guess, by definition, most of their most of their ore associated with a, an A-vein saccharoidal grey quartz vein sulfide event that is explicitly associated with, with K-silicate alteration. Um, at the expense of, of muscovite, um, works in some systems, uh, but there are a whole bunch of other porphyries in which the bulk of the grade is hosted in, in alteration ha halos, such as this one in the picture from Hikira, which are, have a, a, a muscovite stable mineralogy and a muscovite biotite sulfide. So the sulfides are disseminated in this alteration halo. And the, although this particular one has a quartz vein fill, Paragenetically, that's later. These halos form around fractures with effectively no vein fill, and so-called early halo type um, mineralization turns out to be much more common in porphyry systems than than had been appreciated. And as John points out in this in this paper, that may well be a pressure control on the way fluids are exolved out of um, out of porphyritic intrusions. Um, and so that's that's perhaps the latest big jump. In, in the understanding of the porphyry model that, that I can think of. Um, so one of the things we'll come back to a bit later is, is, is the porphyry model finished? And, and what else might there be that we can um, do to improve or what flexibility might the porphyry system model require? Yeah, so hold that thought. So right now we're gonna change tack and go to Zambia and talk about the enterprise nickel deposit. So this is a, a deposit that First Quantum is, is actively um, putting into production or at least doing engineering studies with a view to that. Um, it's an epigenetic nickel sulfide deposit. Um, every time we take people there for the first perhaps dozen years, everybody was looking around for the ultramafic rocks. It's like, can't be the case. You know, we've never seen anything like this before. Where are the ultramafic rocks? Rah, 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 must, there must be ultramafic rocks here somewhere. It must be just uh, a reworked, metasomatized orthomagmatic thing. Well, no, it's not. Um, it's not for a whole bunch of reasons, but it's a pretty healthy deposit. That's part of 40 million tonnes at a percent nickel. Um, it's the kind of thing that, that we quite happily find again, um, if and when we could. So the, the diagrams here, the background diagram is um, a composite set of sections for different bits of the copper belt from Dave Selly. Um, I'm highlighting here that Enterprise is hosted in a relatively compressed section. Uh, it's not in the Kafui anticline, as suggested by this, this the label on the diagram. It's on the other side of the copper belt. But... The diagram is useful. It serves to point out that we're not in the deep part of the basin. We're in a very shallow part of the basin where the stratigraphy is, is relatively thin. Uh, the total, total strat pile might only be a kilometre thick at the moment. Um, it was probably thicker before it lost a bunch of salt. Um, and you can calibrate a generic section. I've just blown up the Kafui section here. You can calibrate the local stratigraphy to that Kafui section without trying very hard. It's got a crystalline basement. In our case, this is these are nicic. Um, case bar biotite, garnet bearing gneisses and, and schists. It's got a basal plastic package, which in our case is, starts off with some quartzo sandstones and then has a, a quite distinctive talc hematite, uh, phyllite, I guess would be the appropriate um, non-committal rock name. Um, so things with a, with a strong um, tectonic foliation and, and, and a banding, which is Sometimes you can convince yourself it's sedimentary and sometimes looks metamorphic, uh, dominated by talc and hematite and quartz. Um, that grades up relatively quickly into, I mean, quickly, the gradation is relatively short, um, into a set of grey rocks, which would have been dolomitic siltstones and various, variously grey to black dolomitic siltstones. So the black ones now are a, are a black slaty rock. Um, the more carbonate bearing gray ones have been recrystallized and marbleized in many cases. Um, but yeah, imagine this is going from a, a, a plastic package into a more carbonate mud sort of environment that was locally um, carbonaceous. There's quite remarkable fold thickening of, of this unit and the top of the tower. We'll see, see that a bit later. Um, 
And then there's a very messy complex zone at the top of this unit, which is dominated these days by calc silicate or scarnoid rocks. Um, it's got genuine gabbroic intrusions in it, but most of the things that look a bit scarnoid and have been described as well, amphibolites or, or meta, meta gabbros or meta volcanics are actually not. They don't contain anything like enough titanium to, to be primary mafic rocks. Um, and instead they seem to be metasomatized carbonates, like dirty, dirty dolomites that have been that have been cooked up. Um, and then there's a, a tectonic surface, it's not very well defined, but what we see above that is a very thick package of a polylithic dolomite cemented breccia, um, which we interpret as being a halokinetic product, effectively a, uh, what's left of a, a once much thicker evaporitic unit. Um, these are pretty common in the, in the copper belt and, and this particular fabric of a thing that is 30, 40, 70% matrix with, with a variety of clasts that have corroded um, sub-rounded boundaries is, um, is very mm -hmm. typical in, in the Katangan. Um, then there's another tectonic surface and above that an effectively unaltered package of, of Sturtian um, dimictic, dimic diet and related glaciogene sediments. So that's the, the stratigraphy and it is entirely recognizable um, and mm -hmm. translatable in, in terms of, of a well-known Katangan stratigraphy. Here's what some of these rocks look like. So the bottom picture there, we've got this, this talc hematite um, phyllitic thing I was talking about. In this particular case, it's not folded, it frequently is. Then we've got a, a pinstripe black slate. The, um, the white laminae in here would have been the more clay rich units. And now they're, they've been metasomatized, metamorphosed to kyanite porphyroblast of different sizes. So we have lots and lots of kyanite. We have kyanite in the veins. Some of the pale sort of blue gray stuff in this in this quartz vein is kyanite as well. Um, and then we have clearly a, a late sulfide vein here, which is bringing in, in this particular case, bravoite and, and nicolo and pyrite. Um, so that's a pretty typical sort of ore grade rock. That's the, that's the best of the host units. Um, there's not much carbon left in it, but occasionally, occasionally we find relict um, organic carbon in these rocks. Um, come up to the top of the system. Here's some of these calc silicate scarnoid things. Um, they're generally not mineralized. Um, and it's kind of interesting that they don't seem to have accommodated very much by way of um, ductile strain. And then here's one of these post-evaporite post uh, polylithic breccias, so-called fluidized breccia in, um, in our local nomenclature. Um, what else to say here? Okay, so you notice I've got some, some time, some, some ages on the column here, the basements. 1.9 GA, the basal sediments are classic, or at least um, have to be younger than about 0.8 GA as dictated by detrital zircon geochronology. Um, and the Sturtian glacials, we know how old they are. Um, every time we date anything in this part of the world, we get numbers around about 500 million years. And there are, there are lots of datable minerals associated with the, the magnesium alteration. The alteration is primarily talc and magnesite um, phlogopite. So lots of magnesium moving around, very, very saline fluid. Um, and the phosphate minerals are quite unhappy. So there's new apatite, there's new monazite, there's xenotime, there's rutile. Um, there's lots of things, there's tight, I think in some places, there's lots of things you can date. And every time we date them, doesn't matter what mineral we date, we get numbers around about 500 million years, which is the, the, the timing of the Lufillian like defamation, the, the principal inversion event relevant to this basin. Um, it's also the time of intrusion of, a, of an A-type granite swarm, um, which is um, not explicitly relevant here. We don't know that there are any of those so-called hook sweet granites in, in this environment, uh, but definitely the main defamation happens around about um, 500 million years ago. And that seems to be when, when all of the, certainly when all the mm, datable minerals were either formed or reset um, and so we have big arguments about whether the mineralization was early and has been deformed or is related to, to the metamorphism. Um, you note on the side here that this is Patty Capistrant's section. She's showing the copper as being basal and the nickel as being throughout the package. That's real. The copper is strata bound and for all the world looks like early um, pre-deformation mineralization. Uh, looks a, and There's a tiny bit of cobalt attached to it as well. And it looks like said copper style mineralization. Um, whereas the nickel is entirely related to these, these late veins and, and structures and which perhaps 
provoke some some thought of this argument around diagenetic versus um, metamorphic timing for mineralization. So what are the possibilities? Um, the really obvious possibility is that enterprise is, or said hosted nickel in general, is just a variation on a theme of said copper, that if your fluid is sufficiently salty, if it's a really, really gnarly bitter and brine with north of 50% salt, which is to say it's really a wet molten salt rather than a rather than a water. Um, and we know that to be the case. Some of the, some of the fluid inclusions here, my colleague Wincher Zimba did a master's in which he documented fluid inclusions up to 70 weight percent salt um, in this environment. So is it just a really strange, really weird salty fluid? And if you do that, then you make this crazy magnesium alteration and move a lot of nickel um, and like give yourself the opportunity to move nickel around. Um, and or did we have some kind of pre-existing nickel rich um, host rock? Um, and so maybe you don't need a super fluid, maybe you need a good, a, a preferentially enriched source. And then any said copper kind of um, evaporitic fluid can, can move the nickel around. We don't know, but those are the kinds of things that would perhaps take place in a, in a said nickel model that derives a lot of its inspiration from a said copper um, understanding. But when you look at the rocks at at Enterprise, I, I made the point before, um, the vein, especially the nickel bearing veins and the geometries are not really what you expect all the time. Um, as I said, you, you never see stratiform um, or pre-deformation nickel mineralization. It's it's all late. There's a there's a slew of different vein styles. You can see in my little schematic here, I'm trying to show different, different vein types. And you can see some of those vein types, early, early layer parallel things that have been buckled and deformed during folding. You know, here's another one that was originally a straight vein, cuts across the, the, the sedimentary lamination, and it's been progressively deformed as, as the rock has accommodated more and more strain. Um, that's, that's pretty typical. Those things are, are, are barren, effectively. Sometimes they get reinvaded and reopened. Um, and then you can also see here that there's a, a little fold here with, a, with, with what appears to be a thrust attachment um, in the actual planar orientation. And we've got a big quartz vein, quartz sulfide vein opening up what appears to be the actual planar orientation of that, of that little fold. That's a, that's a relationship that we see at the deposit scale as well. That if we take all the veins and put, stick them on a stereo net, they, they approximate the actual planar orientation of, of the, the main fold geometry. Um, and then there's a few of these late discordant sulfide things that are partly replacive that cut across everything else. Um, so that, that, that general relationship between quartz veining and deformation and, and metal introduction isn't so different to some slate belt gold systems. Um, and so that gets you thinking, well, maybe it is about the metamorphism. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's more important than, um, than anything else. And so we could imagine in, if we wanted to build a model for said hosted nickel, that rather than thinking of it as just said copper on steroids, maybe we should be thinking about it as, as, as the product of metamorphism of, of particular evaporite rocks. You know, if you metamorphose a, a bitter and like a, a sedimentary package containing a, um, an inter, um, yeah, hosting a, a primary bit, really nasty bitter and brine with some mafic rocks in the package, hence nickel source, what do you get? Well, so long as there's some black, if there's some black shales in that package as well, then do you get a carbonate sulfide vein system in an icely, isoclinally folded black slate? So this section here is a real section through the deposit. Um, the only thing not real about the section is the black line I've sketched on to, to help, help you visualize what we think is going on structurally, that the, the host shale here has been buckled and, and folded back on itself. Um, it's then been folded again in another direction, but that's a, that's a story for another day. Um, and so the part of what makes the thing economic is that it's, it's a nice sort of blob shaped ore body. Um, if we, if we unfolded it out to being a, a sheet several kilometers long and, and only five or 10 meters thick, it'd be a much more difficult thing to mine. But nonetheless, from a model standpoint, there are two options here. And you know, it could be a bit of both as there is in said copper. And, and we don't, um, we haven't solved it yet. I'm not pretending for a second that we know e exactly what the answer is. If you wanted to go looking for this kind of deposit, um, so here's a, the map here is, is a soil chemical map or it's a, it's a grid based on the soil chemistry and I'm showing nickel because that's what we're looking for. 
the numbers range from lows of you know tens of ppm up to several hundred ppm and in fact i think peaks exceed a thousand ppm in some places um it's a big scale 10k scale bar down the bottom so we're looking at a whole district here 50ks by 50ks more or less um and where's the enterprise nickel deposit on this map well it's just there right in the middle of the map there's a tiny little white circle on the map showing where it is um and the point that i want to really hammer with this is that we didn't you don't find one of these just by relying on the nickel geochemistry there's um there are so many other things out there that throw nickel soil anomalies this band of really strong nickel around here is just a talco siltstone with no no other metal in it but all the talc carries about 0.1 percent nickel and so everywhere we have talco's rocks we have these screaming great nickel anomalies in the soil um you can try to mitigate that playing some some geochemical tricks but it's it's actually pretty hard um i've i've tortured this data quite a lot and i struggle to make enterprise stand up as as an anomaly that's just that's really distinctive um a lot of these lower tenor things over here in the east are are actually are actual mafix a gabros or basalt things that have got high background nickel um but suffice to say that it's a small target um because nickel's worth a lot more than copper it has a limited surface expression um, unfortunately, it has no particular magnetic response. It doesn't contain pyrotite. The rocks don't contain magnetite to begin with, so it doesn't stand up as a like as a demagnetization zone. Um, there's no effectively no carbon left in it, and it doesn't have an EM response. In in dramatic contrast to the Sentinel mine, this white band down here is the the Sentinel fillite. That thing conducts like there's no tomorrow, and is very obvious in in airborne EM. Um, so how are you how are you going to find it? And I guess so part of the I guess the exploration model aspect of this is that the magnet the district scale magnesium metasomatism seems to be a fundamental feature. Um, there are similar occurrences in the southern Congo. I think we're we're now up to maybe well a whole bunch in this district and then a bunch in the southern Congo. Uh, Menda and Shinkalobwe come to mind. Um, the magnesium metasomatism is a is a persistent feature of of the system. Um, but beyond that they need a reductant they they need a black a black rock of some sort even if most of the carbon might have since been burnt away so how are you going to find that um, in this environment we we proxy for the carbon mostly using vanadium um, vanadium that was originally complex with the organic material um, is fixed in in muscovite and biotite and actinolite um, they all take a bit of it um, during the during the alteration um, so look for things that that might have had carbon in them and for structural anomalies. So like I said, the, the, the fold environment of enterprise seems to be important in the grade development. Um, how you go about identifying that structural position before you have a, a really good geologic map? Well, I don't think you can. So the, this observation that you need to be careful about structural anomalies is really to say, try really hard to make a really good map. Um, and in our case, the, this particular soil survey allowed us to draw really, really beautiful um, interpreted surface lithology maps. And we married that with field mapping where we could. There's not a lot of outcrop. Um, but ultimately, we have a these days have a pretty strong structural understanding of, of this district. Um, and if we'd done that first, the, the places that are mineralized would have would have stood up as being as being structural anomalies. Beyond enterprise, if we open our minds to the possibility of nickel being a hydrothermal or a metal that is concentrated by hydrothermal fluids, then maybe there's a whole family of them. Maybe it's just a question of salinity and availability. If you have nickel in the rocks and a hypersaline fluid, so it's taking, I guess, the, the, the said copper-like um, interpretation of, of enterprise, then what else might be possible? Could you have nickel in an ICG? Well, yeah, you could. There is one, and it's probably more than one. There's certainly one that's good enough to be a mine. Um, could you have nickel in scans and loads out like outboard of of large plutonic rocks? Um, yeah, you can certainly do that. Tend to be lower grade, but they exist. Um, where where those plutons have been emplaced into um, ultramafic rocks with high background nickel? Could you have nickel in epithermal deposits? Even well, yeah. This picture on the right here is is coliform banded primary um, nickel silicate minerals in with quartz and chalcedony other things in an epithermal vein in Serbia admittedly cutting an ultramafic rock but showing that it's possible for hydrothermal fluids to mobilize nickel move it around and re-precipitate it so that's nice it's easy to imagine we can imagine a number of things that are possible as an explorer 
perhaps the more important question is what's probable. Um, we could spend our lives running around exploring for things of for which there's one example in the world. Um, case in point, I don't think I'd go looking for epithermal nickel anytime soon. They're, they're fairly scarce. We'd perhaps be better advised to look at what's probable. And so where do you draw that line around what's probable versus what's possible is, is I guess, uh, a bit of a nagging, a nagging conundrum for us. Um, but at least in the case of the said nickel example, there's enough of them now, at least in the Katangan. I'm not aware of any in other basins in the world, um, but I'd like to know if anyone's seen one. Um, there's enough of them in the Katangan that, that, that it's, it's a real possibility to, for us to work up a set of guidelines for helping it understand that deposit, understand how to explore for it and apply that in the Katangan. Right, so we'll come back, come right back to porphyries again. Observations that force model shifts and, and where's, what's left for the porphyry model because it's probably the, arguably the most elegant and best understood uh, model in the world. Um, there's a bunch of things we could talk about, um, but I'm gonna pick my favorite as regards I guess, area selection and, and big scale stuff. Here's a picture of white pine, uh, white pine, um, white island, sorry, um, in Northern Island, New Zealand. We're just off the coast of Northern New Zealand, showing some really beautiful uh, acid sulfate fumarolic alteration in a, a degraded volcanic edifice. It's held up as the classic modern example of an active high sulfidation system. If you do any of the master's courses through UTAS, prior to a bit of a tourism disaster at White Island a couple of years back. Um, they would take you here and get you to walk around on this stuff and pick up bits of rock that look exactly like they've come out of a, a high sulfidation epithermal system. Where is it? Here's a, a bit of a composite image of stolen from one of Matt Laybourne's papers. White Island's just here off the north coast of, of New Zealand. And what we're looking at is the bathymetry of the Kermadec arc and a, an intra-arc rift and a series of volcanoes, on submarine, um, calc alkaline stratovolcanoes um, on the seafloor um, of the, the active Kermadec arc. And what Matt Laybourne and his, and his colleagues were able to do was go out and study the, um, what was happening in the, in the sea and, uh, in and around some of these volcanoes. And a couple of sections here just showing seawater temperature and mapping out the hydrothermal plume and the behaviour of, of the hydrothermal plume coming off, in this case, the the inner wall of a caldera. This is a, a section through a, through a caldera. And we've got effectively submarine fumarolic activity um, halfway up the wall. Here's a, a different section through the same volcano and we see a, a bigger concentration of effectively hot water, but it implied hydrothermal contribution to the sea um, in that location. Same arc, tens, hundreds of Ks along the arc in the same tectonic environment, more or less. And we're seeing here, we're seeing it in a subaerial thing. We go, yeah, we recognize that. And we think that that relates to high sulfidation epithermal systems. We see this and we go, oh, that, that's VMS behavior. Oh, well, okay. Well, are they the same thing? Is the difference just the water depth? Move to the other side of the world. Here's some information around uh, a camp of mineral deposits in, in central Western Bulgaria. Um, called the Panag Panagurishta district. Chalapech is a really distinctive deposit, which is um, copper gold massive sulfide deposit. It's, what, it's one of the largest active gold mines in Europe, underground mine, um, has very distinctive submarine VMS-like features in it and is hosted as documented by Shambhafor and Moritz a few years back, is, is hosted in submarine volcanic rocks um, that are effectively age equivalent to the to the mineralization. So it's hosted in a package of rocks that are the same age as, as the deposit itself. The rocks were submarine and the deposit looks and feels a bit like a massive sulfide, like a VMS type massive sulfide, save that it's got meter wide veins of anegite that cut across it and local domains of advanced stagelic alteration. So this is a thing that spans the observational characteristics of VMSs and epithermals, but also happens to be time equivalent here from Albrecht von Quad's paper, time equivalent to the Alatite Porphyry, which is literally a kilometer and a half over the back of the hill. So in this particular example, we've seen porphyries and epithermal-like behavior and VMS-like behavior in the same place at the same time. So I said, all right, well, how much do we think we know about porph the relationship between these different deposit styles? Here's a picture of the, 
the bore open pit in Serbia. Um, it's um, that's a picture taken a few years back now, but I don't think it looks terribly dissimilar at the moment. The the beige stuff in the bottom in the floor of the pit is a bleached acid altered rock. Some of them it's most mostly um, sericite alteration in this particular case. Um, there is advanced dogelic material here, but it's quite restricted. And that's the point. All these rocks around the margins are only weakly propylatized. They're still recognizably andesites. They've got a small amount of chlorite epidote in them. But if we were talking about the upper part of a porphyry in a conventional model, the part that transitions to high sulfidation mineralization, conventionally, that model that I put up at the start of the talk we imagine a lithocat. We imagine broad domains of bleached rock, broad domains of really acid altered leached rock with a mineral assemblage, which is going to be quartz, adenite, kaolinite, pyrophyllite, grading down into, into sericitic things. But now both of these deposits, sections here through bore and through chukri pecky, pinched from the reservoir minerals um, presentation a couple of years ago, um, have porphyry shown in purple, transitioning up into epithermal mineralization in the case of bore several quite distinct massive sulfide uh, ore bodies and what are they do these live within a lithocap no they don't they've got very tight advanced argillic um sort of zone around them but outboard of that they live in what appears to be a weak propylitic alteration and that's a bit of a problem for our our standard um porphyry and porphyry family model but come back to this idea of being underwater, I wonder then, is this behavior that we observe in, in some of these porphyries in, in Eastern Europe, a function of hydrology and what happens when, you, when, when a porphyry tries to form under the sea? And so that's a question that, that I'm, I'm actively trying to sort out at the moment. If it's something that any of you find interesting, by all means, get in touch with me, um, but I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Tim. That was a really good overview of uh, two reasonably well-established models and how that that's not really the full story when it comes to being an explorationist and looking for looking for for new deposits and new exploration areas so um tim this is a, a really broad-reaching talk where you talked about maybe some specific deposits in particular but more importantly how they apply and then how they don't fit uh, in, in genetic models one of the things that mm, personally is interesting to me is this this issue you raise here at the very very end where it's like what if you have a porphyry forming in a place where we didn't the model doesn't necessarily include that place as, as the formation location for the porphyry and in the geologic record we might see this as a lith lithological heterogeneity i mean in the porphyry model one of the things that is commonly assumed is that all of the rocks have reasonably similar permeability. They're all this volcanic, the volcanic uh, package that, that's overlying the porphyry. And this isn't necessarily always the case when, when you have in, intrusions and you have different styles of porphyry you have these post-collisional settings and all this where your, your geologic terrain is not, it's not as nice as the model, <laughs> so, so to speak. So then how do you, um, how do you, how do you maneuver that model as a as a targeting a generative to generate a new project? How do you maneuver that model into te tectonic settings or or just geologic settings that aren't in the model already? Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a there's a bit in there. <laughs> um, the to the point of. I guess, how does a model manifest when, when some of the local stuff is different? So the, the host rock heterogeneity question is, is a real one. It's one I'm going to South America in a few weeks' time, and we're going to talk to our team exactly about that. You know, what happens if you put a porphyry in the sandstone? What happens if you put a porphyry in a limestone? I guess my point around at least models and how we write them down is that if you tried to specify every one of those permutations, you'd be writing for months. And that's, that's the problem with, with, with oh, being trying to be too specific in the model. What I'd rather do is that the model tell you about process. So if we understand roughly the chemistry of the fluids and the temperature of the fluids coming off of porphyry, then we need to be flexible as geologists to be able to interpret, okay, what does that mean for the wall rocks? How are they going to react? So 
we should expect if you go to and I, I we can point at one of one or two examples we might have seen you've worked on scans um so you would know something about how how carbonate materials react when you put a hot fluid near them um i remember i i visited once the the triple air deposit in in central central turkey um triple is really interesting because it's it's a, a low-grade porphyry with a big epithermal thing emplaced in at the 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 floor of a limestone thrust sheet and the limestone is is beautifully marbleized on top of it and there's like little scans that poke their way up through the limestone and there's like sinkholes and things that are related to the hydrothermal system and so if we tried to capture the all those little observations in a model it'd just be too voluminous a document um, i'd rather we think about understand what's going on and back ourselves as geologists to predict what the what the outcome is going to be um, as for as for tectonics it's the same thing just on a bigger scale so this the the underwater porphyry thing or the 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 coexistence in space of porphyries and vmss that i guess was generally taught as being anti those two deposit styles were generally taught as being antithetic to each other in in metallogenic terms um it doesn't always cross over. A lot of EMSs form in truly extensional environments where the potential for porphyries is close to zero. Lots of porphyries form in subaerial environments where the potential for VMSs is effectively zero. Um, there are one or two places mysteriously where the tectonics gets it right. The question at the moment is that I don't think we quite know what that magic crossover is. Um, and so that's a that's where, where research comes in. It's where... I, where I think if you were going to do research that was really interesting in informing these kinds of these kinds of subjects, that's the kind of stuff I'd be trying to figure out. You know, what, what is it that in the Western Tethian, which is particularly well endowed in this regard, you run all the way from Serbia through Bulgaria, through Northern Turkey into Georgia, the whole belt has these confusing hybrid deposits that have a characteristics of, of both porphyries and, and epithermals and VMSs. Um, what is it about that belt? What was going on in the tectonics? Because it's clearly something that's more than local. It clearly is relevant to, to that particular um, tectonic arrangement. See some of the same stuff in British Columbia. See a little bit of the same thing in Eastern Australia. And so there's a, there's a PhD project there begging to be done by someone. <laughs> Well, it's a really good point, and I, speaking to the to, to the West Tepi and stuff, it, it wouldn't be the first time that geologists have argued um, <laughs> whether it's a porphyry style or a BMS style mineralization. And it's interesting that um, to think that maybe can be both if you if you adjust the formation conditions. We have some Tepi and experts, I think, in the audience who might want to join in. But I'll go to Charles for for the next question. <laughs> Uh, going to hand you over to David Wood, who wants to ask. David, please take it away. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Yep, loud and clear. Thanks, Jim. Great talk as always. Um, so question for you. Comment and a question. So one of the you know most useful things about a model is its um, use for you know predictive capability. So navigating a uh, area selection, navigating around in and around a deposit, and arguably you know, elements of those are better understood in Porphyries, you know, when you're looking for, you know, end members of, of, of common processes, that's where the complexity sort of tends to lie. Um, so bring in the point to the sediment-hosted nickel space, um, and would you argue that you would look explicitly for a sediment or try and develop a sediment-hosted nickel model or, you know, style of deposits and, and understand that space better or try and understand get better, more predictivity in the sediment hosted copper space, given that it's arguably not as robust in its, you know, in terms of how predictive uh, it is in terms of those elements and common processes and complexity and end member styles. Yeah, if I, so if I understood your question correctly, what you're really saying is, should we, are we being too narrow in, it, in our attack in trying to just understand said nickel? Should we really be saying, let's understand how base metals move in in salty sedimentary basins let's do that first that's a, a more important kind of broader geologic question uh, is that rough yeah is that where you're going yeah because yeah. i mean the you can argue in the katangan you know you, you can map that same fluid chemistry that's common to enterprise and sentinel it's you know it's at least 200 kilometers by 100 kilometers wide and 
you know, Shinka Lobwe and uh, Mender look very, very different to Enterprise. Yeah. It's, so to your, yes, to that point around how, how small do you start, I, thankfully there's a lot of people that do a lot of work and the models are not constructed overnight. They're a, they're a composite of lots and lots of individual little pieces of work. Um, and I think it's, it's easier to work at deposit scale. It's easier to say, here's, a, here's the scope of the project and here's a bunch of rocks. And they're, they're, not, they're not so variable, each from another, got a limited range of mineralogy, limited range of host rocks. I think, so I think small is, is relatively easy. And there's some of those papers that I put up at the beginning, especially the um, Hedenquist and Lowenstern, it's a review paper. It's the sum total of lots of bits of individual information that have been accumulating over decade, maybe more. And at some point, like the, the contours of a bigger model kind of click into place. I think that's, that's normally how it works um, because it's very hard to do the big stuff before it's supported by lots of little bits of observation and, and, and supporting data um, to begin with. I can, but as a, as a geologist, sure, I'd rather, I'd rather understand the overarching big system. I think that's the, that's the bigger kind of holy grail. Um, but I do think it's pretty tough to get there without doing all the, all, all the small scale studies first. I mean, perhaps you can try to do them in parallel. It doesn't have to be a, a one, two sequence. Sure, because I mean, as, as a generative geo, that's the sort of link you're going to make up to area selection. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, that's, that's where I, so I mean, I've, I've been rabbiting on now about porphyries in the Tethian and whether they're underwater and how they vary from the Andes for, well, you would have heard me give a talk like that seven years ago. Um, within first quantum, I've been like dog with a bone trying to solve that with the limited resources and limited time that I've got. Um, yes, you would love as a gener generative geo, you want those questions answered and you'd prefer they're answered today. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. No worries. Thanks for the question. Sorry, I just muted myself. Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, so now uh, I have a question from the audience. Tim, uh, do you think that the majority of companies are open to deal with these model shifts uh, and these new ideas uh, as this has a major role on exploration survey planning? Very good question. Um, the, the way that it, it might even be unhelpful for me to be talking about playing with models and varying models. I think there's, there's a lot of geology that gets, gets done that abuses the models that exist already. And what, what I mean by that is anyone that's got a, a crystalline rock with a vein in it with a bit of an alteration halo will hold it up and say, oh, I've got a porphyry on my property because it's got this is a whatever, like a C-type vein or a B-type vein or something. And therefore, there's a porphyry because I, I recognise this texture, and this texture is part of the model. And therefore, like, so a lot of a lot of poor exploration gets done by forcing things into the model, the models that exist already, um, perhaps inappropriately. Uh, there was definitely a phase when every scan in the world with magnetite overnight became an ISCG for reasons that defy <laughs> any explanation I can find other than marketing. Um, so. To answer the, the question, I don't think we're really very well equipped for dealing with <laughs> adjusting models too much. You, know, you might be actively unhelpful now that, now that you make me think about it. Um, I'd, I'd prefer to see the, the broader expression will use the models we have well and understand, and in fact, and have the courage to, to say out loud when the things they observe don't fit the model, rather than ignore that and force the model onto the project, but to say, look, this thing that I've got is a bit like a porphyry, but it's got these five things that are different. Or I've got this occurrence and it lives in this environment and it might have characteristics like, I don't know, an MVT or an Irish type deposit or whatever, but it's different for reasons X, Y, Z. Uh, we learn a lot more by recognising the differences than, than by just sweeping them under the carpet. Um, and so that's, I guess, if there's an improvement to be made, it is perhaps by being more honest about what we observe and how what we observe marries or doesn't with the standing models, at least at deposit scale, um, than, than trying to be perhaps too assertive in the, in the model adjustment stakes. So I'd just like to sort of follow up with one of my own comments. Mm -hmm. 
I do think this also extends uh, the real example that jumps out at me is orogenic gold here, where almost anything which is deformed and has a quartz vein with gold will be called orogenic gold. Do you think there's room for this model to, uh, how do I how do I phrase this, sort of develop really? I know there's some interesting discussions about the role of magnetism in formation of orogenic gold deposits, but it's such a, an effective, to a degree, uh, sort of model. Do you think that people have a budge on this? Yeah, you want to be careful about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. That yes, as, an ex as a guide to explorers, it's been a remarkably successful model. <laughs> And so to that end, some parts of it must be right because we use, we use its guidance and we find stuff. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, all, as I said early on, all, all the models are wrong. They're, they're all like, they're wrong in some degree. And so they're all up for adjustment and improvement. Um, the, the orogenic gold one is, is a really, is a really tricky problem. <laughs> I know it's not really problematic, but it, it, it's the cause of lots of geologic debate because, as you say, we focus on the quartz veins and there are many, many geologic environments that make quartz veins. And every time that there's a fluid with roughly the chemical and temperature pressure characteristics that allow it to move some gold, then it precipitates a quartz vein with some gold and we end up describing the product rather than the process because that's what we see, it's what we can describe. Um, and so we get a bit confused. I, I agree. I'm, I'm personally, I'm very open to Scott Halley's observations around, say, the Kalgoorlie area and bits mm -hmm. other greenstone belts in, in Western Australia and suggesting that maybe those things are a metamorphic reworking of gold that was originally, like, say, low-grade epithermal in its, in its character. I think the, the spatial distribution of, of Pathfinder elements that he presents to support that case um, are certainly permissive of, of that hypothesis. Um, there, there have been some older studies at Kalwuli itself around alkaline intrusive rocks and scarnoid development. And that, and so the two together kind of get you thinking, okay, now this, now this, like there's a bit more weight behind the, or a bit, a bit of impetus to, to adjust the model. Um, but I don't, I guess from the point of view of finding an orogenic deposit, the, it's, it's not a huge jump what it, it probably helps you with area selection more than exploration for an explicit deposit, I, I su I'd suggest. Yeah, um, we actually have another question. Before, uh, I, I like the idea of talking about this high level, like how to shift the sort of mentality around it. But while we're on the topic of specifics and, and model, um, well, expanding the models, I think we'll ask Nick Arndt to unmute himself um, to ask a question about uh, is porphyries intruding into subaqueous environments? Okay, I'm un I'm muted. Yeah, Tim, I was intrigued by the by the, your description of these uh, porphyries, which form under uh, under underwater yeah, in mm -hmm. marine settings. And I wondered what whether you would see any record of this if uh, if a magma intrude gets fairly close to the surface surface. In a submarine setting, it'll in, enter rocks which are pretty well imperme uh, permeated with seawater. And basically, I see a contrast between this sort of setting and the on land setting, particularly in Chile, where water is pretty scarce. So, do you see any record, any geochemical record of abundant seawater which might? might certainly influence, perhaps control the types of alteration minerals, the alteration products that are, that form a, in association with the porphyry mineralization. I have to confess, I haven't done that research myself. I've wandered around in the field and I can make observations around mm -hmm. the mappable alteration facies, uh, but certainly that would be one way to, to tie down the story, would be to look at the I guess the isotopic characteristics of, of the alteration minerals, of the chlorites especially, um, and determine how much contribution is there or was there from a magma or, or from, from seawater. Um, I guess it's part of the, the greater porphyry model and part of the understanding have been stable isotope studies that, that allowed us to understand how much of the fluid was contributed from a magmatic source and how much of it was, was groundwater, terrestrial groundwater that was being um, entrained and dragged into a convection cell around the around the outsides for a long time. I think it was held that 
most of the, the philic and propolitic alteration outboard of standard porphyry deposits was supposedly caused by groundwater that had been warmed up, perhaps that had received heat from the magmatic system, but the components of which were supposedly mostly ultimately meteoric groundwaters. Mm -hmm. And the more we've looked, the more we've seen a magmatic influence. And so we see magmatic isotopic compositions in, in the propolitic alteration minerals well outboard of, of some of the Andean porphyries um, and stable isotope studies that like famously again, Jeff Hedenquist mm -hmm. and, and co-workers at El Salvador. Um, I can think of another study at, at Alan Morera, um, documenting, I think that was Anthony Harris, documenting in some detail that the interplay between meteoric contributions in, in the edges of porphyry alteration systems with an increasing magmatic contribution toward the center. What I, what I imagine happens in the submarine environment is, as you say, that that fragmented submarine volcanic pile is going to be saturated yeah. with, with seawater at, at water. some pressure if it's got uh -huh. like a kilometer of water on top of it or something. Um, yes, I imagine that has really dramatic impacts on on how the alter, how the upper alteration facies yeah. manifest. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you if, if it was something that you had the wherewithal to go and study, I think that's that'd be a great way of trying to trying to prove or deny um, part of that story. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just jump in here with the follow-up question that just popped into the chat for, for both of you. And that's uh, if you were going to do this sort of task of trying to trying to determine the, the effect of the geochemical trace of seawater, what would you use? Do you think this would be in the in sort of the um, alkali element uh, ratios or, or how would you do this? This is a question from NR Valiev um, in the chat, but it's a very topical. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I first things first I'd, I'm not a VMS expert at all I've spent a small part of my career working on VMS systems so I don't I'm not really intimately familiar with with what how the trace element distribution around a VMS a classical Kuroko type VMS system works compared to I can talk all day about how it works around a porphyry um, but that's the first place I would look is I'd say okay look at the things that we believe formed on the sea around, or under a, a seawater column and look at their geochemical behavior and see if we can see or similar things happening in say around some of these submarine epithermal come porphyry systems that would be a first protocol as a, as a practical exercise that could be done without a big research project but the next thing as i said if you really wanted to pin that down the 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 academic way of attacking it would i think would be to look at the stable isotopes of the alteration minerals yeah, that's a that's a good point. I know that um, in in these low sulfidation, <laughs> epithermal, and, and carbonate replacement deposits that are associated with intrusions, uh, they've used fluid inclusions chemistry. So looking yeah. at potassium um, potassium calcium ratios, the uh, bromine chlorine ratios, and things like this. But like you said, doing a full fluid inclusion study of your deposit is is a lot more in time intensive and. and uh, money intensive if you want to pay your geologists to do that yeah the, the fluid inclusion thing is is a is a good way of again i guess supporting a supporting the hypothesis um it generally needs really good paragenetic control you want to make sure that the minerals in which you're doing fluid inclusion studies are uh, genuinely re reflect the bit of the process that that you're trying to that you're trying to document and so if we're talking about uh, it's always hard that in the center of the deposit, it's pretty easy to, to talk about which hydrothermal minerals relate to the ore in time yeah. and in, in space. As you get further out into the into the margins, it gets progressively harder. Like we we can map propolitic alteration around porphyries, but it's actually very difficult, hand on heart, to say that that particular stage of propolitic alteration relates directly to the porphyry. Often you have multiple generations of propolitic alteration. Um, so I'm a bit worried about the fluid inclusion approach for those more distal kind of bits of the of what would be the uh, an imagined study area because i'm not sure you'd be able to say what was related to the hydrothermal system versus what was just regular seafloor metasomatism happening every you know every day of the year yeah that's a really good point that's a really good point and as well as the multi multi phases of 
pro-politic alteration, which I guess uh, they're dating now with um, Lisa Hart Madigan is dating this type of thing. There's a couple of comments that I'll just bring up because they're relevant. Um, Jamie Wilkinson says that strontium isotopes would be a way as long as there's some contrast between the ambient seawater and the magma composition. So the, and the host rock composition. Yep. Um, and then Nick commented again and said, it's expect to see differences in types and scale of alteration zone um, before going to trace elements or isotopes or certainly not that yeah. fluid inclusions. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can definitely, well, part of the problem that I bump into a lot as someone who's, spends a lot of time talking about the edges of water deposits rather than the middles of them is that we don't look at the edges very much so there actually isn't a great body of literature that you could lean on to answer that question you know, what is what is the peripheral alteration outboard of a genuine sub subsea floor syngenetic um, massive sulfide deposit look like as compared to the the outboard deposit um, alteration around a porphyry there are very few studies that that sort of deliberately close their eyes to the the center of the deposit and show us what the what, what the fringes look like. Um, but I agree, there will be there will be simple field mathematical observations that can be made that'll that'll allow us that that'll help. It's just that to date there aren't a lot of them published yet. We're going to have to go out and make them. And I'll go to Charles to introduce the next the next one. Thanks, Aaron. So I have a question from the audience for you here, Tim. So how would you go about uh, educating geology students, students and sort of junior geos uh, to avoid placing too much emphasis on these models uh, or trying to force them upon reality, trying to make that cookie cutter to an edge? Yeah, I think the, the key point there is to describe what you see and, and revert to like the, the original models or models that are written in, at least in terms of the descriptive stuff, uh, are written in some detail. So it's very easy to look at a quartz vein, for example, and say, oh, yeah, you know, I've got this vein, it's got, well, oh, it's an A vein or it's a B vein, to stick with Paul, for example. Um, but are you like, sure, really? On, on what basis? You know, what are the, like, we, we jump to that shorthand description because it's convenient. And it is really convenient. Once you've seen a dozen of them, no problem, but every, like it's really common in exploration space to see things that have some of the characteristics of one vein type, but not another, or an alteration facies that has some characteristics of, of a thing that you could place into a porphyry model without trying very hard, but perhaps not, not all the characteristics or it's got something else that's a bit odd. Um, and it, so if we use a, a, like a, a shorthand, if we say, oh, that's potassic alteration or that's phyllic alteration, well, then it's very easy to put it in the model. But if we describe the details more accurately, ah, it's got, you know, I'm seeing shreddy biotite alteration. Is it biotite? And I've got, you know, little, little fine um, magnetite biotite veinlets, and they're associated with a, a, a hard bleaching of the ground mass that I suspect might be K feldspar. You know, that level of description allows, is a lot more foolproof because then some other geo might come along and say, ah, You've got all of those things, but you, know, you, you describe something else that I think alerts you that that it might not fit the model quite as well. So I, the and this, this is not not my advice solely. It's very much what what um, Dave Cook and the codes guys like stressed into their students is that you know describe what you see, describe it in as much detail as your geological capacity allows you to describe, um, and by all means thereafter stick a, a bucket name around it like that, that is your interpretation of the things that you saw um but it's we're always under time pressure and we're trying to do things quickly and it's very easy to just apply the bucket name straight away and so that's what i would that's what i warn against and i'd, I'd encourage early early career geoscientists to to hold on to the, the mantle of making good detailed descriptions okay great so as you said earlier all are wrong some are useful some are attractive <laughs> Okay, Tim, I've just got one final question for you from the audience. This is just sort of a uh, general overview question to finish. So in these uh, volcanogenic porphyry models, uh, does it, uh, do these models indicate why some are mineralized uh, and generate mineral enrichment while others are simply barren? Hmm. I don't 
particularly think that the this the submarine setting well i don't to be honest i don't know enough about that environment in that i haven't i haven't seen enough dud ones to really comment like we we again we make a beeline for the things that are mineralized because it's it's easy and it's attractive and we go there and someone started digging them up so we can actually get a good look at the rocks so we have a very sort of biased view of the world where we know about the things that are mineralized and we don't really know how many have failed you might imagine to you might imagine from a process standpoint that the the marine environment is is better is a higher sits in higher contrast in terms of thermal contrast and chemical contrast with regard to a metalliferous magmatic fluid such that that might be a better trap environment. It might be the case that that submarine environment is better at provoking sulfide precipitation because it's better at cooling because the, you know, an ocean of cold water. Um, and therefore that there are more small sulfide occurrences scattered throughout those, those districts. The equivalent would be, you drive along any road in the Atacama in the Andes and look up at the big volcanoes and there's little sort of sulfurous bleached fumaroles on the, on the, on the walls of all the volcanoes. How many of those things have actually got sulfide mineralization in them? Don't know. Some, but not all of them. Take that same environment and put it underwater. It might be that every one of those fumaroles actually makes a bit of sulfide mineralization because the seawater's um, provoking sulfide precipitation. I don't know. That's, that's possible. Um, but that's the yeah that, that's that's one of the considerations. Um, it's certainly I'd argue that th my, my experience as an explorer in the Western Tethian is that there are a lot of small occurrences. There are a few, there are a handful of great deposits as well. But there might it might be the case that there are more small deposits in the the submarine environment because of the efficiency, effectively the cooling and chemical contrast efficiency of of having seawater as the the ambient stuff around the outside, um, that could be could be the case. But I, yeah, that short of batting around the idea, I can't I can't give you a clear answer. Thanks, that's it. Well, I mean, I know uh, I think it's either in the next few days or early next week. There's an IODP uh, sort of uh, excursion to go and look at this giant deposit on the Mid Atlantic Ridge. I believe it's about 40, 40 million tons. So you never know if that might provide some valuable insights. Hopefully, some oh, of these yeah. Might be, uh... yeah, without without any doubt, those those pieces of work, including the the bit that I showed you from the Kermadec, have been incredible in helping people imagine the way geology actually works. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that we're about done with questions. We finished pretty good on time, so thank you for that, and thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, Tim, I don't know if you have any last uh, last comments of what you're working on next or what, what the what's important um, take home messages from this. But it's uh, yeah, I'll give you back the floor for a last moment. Okay, well, thank you for that. Thanks everyone who who came along and listened. I hope I hope you heard something that caught your attention or you found interesting. Um, if you thought I was dramatically wrong on anything, please get in touch with me. Um, it's science after all, and we're trying to trying to get closer to the truth. We, we don't proclaim that we know everything. Um, so yeah, like I'm, this is, these are the things that I grapple with. I'm, I'm actively involved in trying to understand as, as Dave Wood mentioned, trying to understand how base metals work in, in intercontinental salty basins. I'm actively involved in trying to understand how, Porphyries and epithermals and VMSs might or might not relate to each other, and um, those are those are ongoing research subjects, and they they take a long time. And you notice that at the start, the some of those that evolutionary pathway for porphyries I mentioned spans, you know, a hundred years or thereabouts, and still going. Um, are we, if there's if there's a takeaway, it's that none of this stuff is fixed, and that if you make if you make good observations and keep your eyes open, that there's there's still plenty to learn about about the natural world. Um, it's still easy as a student to come in and think it's all been done. No, I'm not convinced that's true. Thanks for joining everybody and uh, join us this afternoon or wherever it is for you at 17 GMT um, for uh, Diane Mitchinson is going to be joining us from the University of British Columbia to talk about discovering porphyries undercover uh, in British Columbia and how to use geophysical data to, to approach um, systems that are blind at the surface. Uh, it's a really important topic and uh, hope to see you there.
Uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you need your link of a certificate of attendance, just email us at info at orderdepositshub.com. And with that, I'd like to thanks once again, Tim Ireland and everybody here.